Hi, welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. In this episode, we'll be celebrating another African legend. William Edward Burgat Du Bois, more popularly known as W.E.B. Du Bois. And yes, Du Bois, not Du Bois. I'm being faithful to the way he pronounced his name. W.E.B. Du Bois was a sociologist, historian, and great thinker, and activist. His works focused on African-American communities, Africa, and the African diaspora. His thoughts and activism helped to shape black political culture in the United States as one of the most active founders of the NAACP and internationally through the Pan-African movement. W.E.B. Du Bois was born on the 23rd of February, 1868. He was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, where he also spent his early years. A consummate scholar from childhood, W.E.B. Du Bois graduated as the valedictorian from his high school in 1884. He was supported by his community to study for his Bachelor of Arts at Fisk University in Nashville, uh, Tennessee. While studying at Fisk, he taught in African American schools during the summer holidays. After receiving his first degree from Fisk, he was accepted to study at Harvard, but he had to study for another, he first had to study for another bachelor's degree because almighty Harvard did not recognize his degree from Fisk, which was a black university. He proved the quality of the education which he got from Fisk by graduating cum laude from Harvard within two years. He then proceeded to continue studying history and economics at the University of Berlin in Germany. He got a Master of Arts from Harvard in 1891 and in 1895 he became the first African American to receive a doctorate from Harvard. One of the earliest researches which he carried out on a black community in Philadelphia between 1896 and 1897 was groundbreaking because it allowed him to provide empirical evidence to debunk the negative views held about black people. He also used his research to prove that the problems of the black community was due to segregation and he highlighted the importance of democratic equality. Unlike most of his contemporaries who were advocating at the time, um, Du Bois believed that black people in the US should embrace their African heritage while participating as equal citizen within the larger society. Dr. Du Bois was an integral player in the founding of the NAACP, as well as the Pan-African movement. He was the one who articulated the call by the Pan-African movement for the recognition of first the sovereignty of um, the few independent black countries like Haiti, Liberia, Abyssinia, uh, Ethiopia in 1900. He also challenged views held by scholars in elite schools like uh, Columbia University, which blamed black people for the failure of reconstruction. I will return to the Bogos studies uh, by Columbia University later. But first, let me quickly talk about reconstruction because it was a significant interlude 
in African American history. Reconstruction was the brief period between 1865 and 1877, during which black people in America enjoyed self-determination. This was after the Civil War, when the northern parts of the U.S., which won the war, tried to make good the promise which had been made during the war to lure black people into uh, joining them in the fight against the South, which was the uh, stronghold of slavery. Now, the North had promised that if they won, Slavery would be given, slaves would be given their freedom. So, to honor this promise, the U.S. Congress passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which declared civil and political rights for African Americans across the South. These amendments gave African Amer uh, Americans their freedom and they were guaranteed the same rights as any other American citizens. In addition, black men were given the right to vote, just like their white um, contemporaries, because at the time, the vote was generally denied women. As a result of these amendments, about 700 African Americans were actually elected to hold various public offices. Seven of them even emerged as um, senators, and 14 others won seats to the House of Reps. This was, of course, met by stiff opposition from the South. The South was still smarting from losing the war, but to now expect them to allow their former slaves enjoy all these rights all over the south hell broke loose this uh, the south went into action to enact their own laws um, which they called the black codes they are better known to us as jim crow laws now these laws limited the legal rights of black people to only things like the right to marry and own some property. And although the Black Codes um, allowed um, African Americans to sue in court, it was illegal for them to serve on juries or testify against white people or even serve in state militias. The Black Code also stipulated that black sharecroppers and tenant farmers had to sign an annual um, had to sign annual labor contracts with their white landowners. If they refused, they could be arrested and hired out for work, whether or not they wanted to. Another significant thing to note is that this was the time when the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan was born to terrorize African Americans in the South, especially the community leaders. Also, after the war, a progressive movement by some members of the US Congress tried to provide land to former slaves, but the move was thwarted, and so it was unsuccessful. As a result, former slaves were not compensated for their enslavement. This made some black people in a few places in the South decide to seize land from their former owners. But the federal troops that were situated in the South at the time, rather than support the black people to hold on to the land that they seized, they actually helped restore the land to the white landowners. And um, so by 1871, even though the Congress passed legislation that was supposed to curb the KKK, the federal government's military presence was totally withdrawn from various um, southern states. 
and by 1877, the last of the federal troops in the South were finally withdrawn. Without the troops to enforce the laws that allowed the amendments that allowed black people to live freely, reconstruction collapsed, and all across the South, lynching, disenfranchisement, and segregationist laws were passed and enforced to return former slaves to servitude. Imagine having enjoyed freedom for a few years and then suddenly being forced back into slavery. So black Americans in the South had to wait till 1962 with the effort of the civil rights uh, movement before the Jim Crow laws were finally outlawed. Of course, black people were blamed for the failure of reconstruction. As I said earlier, a group of scholars from Columbia University had actually conducted a sham research which concluded that the reason why reconstruction failed was because black people were lazy and incompetent. This again demonstrates one of the ways in which academic institutions colluded with oppressive regimes in order to continue the exploitation of black people. It is not too different from what is going on now in academic circles. Dr. Du Bois first challenged this research by academics from Columbia University in a paper which he, in which he pointed to the role of the federal government in sabotaging the efforts of the Southern black leaders as the major reason for the failure of reconstruction. He also listed some of the significant achievements of black people during reconstruction. He insisted that as brief as the period of reconstruction was, black people succeeded in establishing free schools and putting some social welfare systems in, in place. He later went, he went on to publish um, an extensive book on a reconstruction titled Black Reconstruction. Please look for it. It is an instructive book that is relevant, you know, even till today. Um, so in this book titled Black Reconstruction, he elaborated more on the achievements of black people and how the federal government was responsible for the failure, failures of, um, failure of reconstruction. Although a meticulous and consummate researcher, Dr. Du Bois could not get established publishers to accept his works for publication because of his determination to correct the negative views held about black people. But he was relentless and did not allow that to deter him. He set up his own publication to publish his views and research findings. He wrote one of the earliest history books on black people called The Negro. The Negro. Please look for the book. The book refutes claims that Africans were inferior and contains a lot of ideas that have come to frame Afrocentric thinking. The, 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 the Negro envisioned the unity and solidarity of black people all around the world as the way to liberate all of us. I mean, the, the thinking behind the book is that so long as some of us remain enslaved, the rest of us can never really be free. His approach to combating racism was quite holistic. He realized the importance of breaking down and awakening the world to the dangers of adulterated history. Also worried that the textbooks used by African-American um, children ignored black history and culture, Dr. Du Bois established a children's magazine 
called the Brownies book. Again, his approach to politics was very interesting and pragmatic. He did not trust either of the two major political parties at the time, so he believed in voting for the lesser of two evils if a third option was not available. A very useful lesson for all of us today. He also rightly identified that the real cause of the First World War was the greed of the European countries and their scramble for Africa. Now, another aspect of Dr. Du Bois' uh, um, worldview is important to me as an African and a, and a feminist. His position on women's rights to vote should be instructive to feminists today. Throughout his writings, Dr. Du Bois supported women's rights. His essay, The Damnation of Women, celebrates the dignity of women, particularly black women. However, he did not publicly support the women's right to vote movement because the leaders of the suffragette movement at the time refused to endorse the struggle against racial injustice. He was so thoroughly committed to the Pan-African movement and he attended Ghana and Nigeria's Independence Day ceremonies. He migrated to Ghana where he became a naturalized citizen. He died there on the 27th of August, 1963. Incidentally, this was a, just a day before the Civil Rights March in Washington, D.C., which took place on the 28th of August, 1963. It is easy to therefore imagine that having spent his entire lifetime committed to the struggle, this old man, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, died the night before the match so that his spirit could join Dr. Martin Luther King and others on that epoch-making march. The Ghanaian government, under President Kwame Nkrumah, accorded him a well-deserved honor of a state burial. Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois started the Encyclopedia of the Negro as far back as 19, the 1930s. Some of his other writings include The Philadelphian Negro, The Negro in Business, the souls of black folk you must you should find that book it was one of the books that first introduced me to dr w e b du bois's uh, writings the souls of black folk he also wrote a biography of john brown efforts for social betterment among negro americans the gifts of black folk the Negroes in the Making of America. In Nitty Chronicles, the, the role of Negroes in the Making of America. He also wrote, um, Africa is geography, people, and products. Uh, they just, again, do a search of um, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, and you'll find a whole list of um, you know, very important works, treasures that he left us. So please, if you have not yet subscribed to this channel, don't forget to do so, so that we can continue bringing you, you know, more of this kind of information that is sadly lacking in um, most academic systems. Um, and the idea is to present them in a way that, you know, anybody can enjoy, even young people. And uh, so please like us and uh, don't forget to, Share with your contacts. See you next time.